touch on a couple other things on the card. I believe Tasha Jonas and Rhiannon Dixon are no longer on the bill. Was that opponent issues? Yeah, I mean, it's, I was disappointed with Joe Gallagher's comments because, you know, we'd agreed a deal with Natasha Jonas for her to fight rematch Katie Taylor for huge money uh, or to fight for the world title on this card. They decided to take an eight-round fight instead. Um, we gave them six opponents, of which they turned down every one of them. You know, some of them had been beaten, I think, four in the last six fights. Um, they came back with one opponent that I felt was unacceptable. Uh, we ended up accepting it, and then she was not available. And they came to me with another opponent who was one and ten, or two and ten. I just said no. Like you know, I don't, at the end of the day, we're, we're responsible for the fights that are made, and we want to keep people active. But you know, it just got to a point where you know, and, and I see comments. You know, the promoters didn't provide an opponent. Six opponents they turned down. You know, and, and I know that some people want to take easier fights, but Tasha's a world-class fighter. And there's nothing wrong with her fighting someone who's been beaten, you know, by Taylor on points, by Brackhouse on points, by uh, Farias twice on points. But, you know, she's, she's, she should be beating those guys easily. So, so I only get stick when you make a mismatch. I don't want to make a mismatch. That was her only chance. You know, I'm a big fan of Natasha Jonas. Have been for years. I think she has everything it takes to still become a champion here today, coming right off a loss to Katie Taylor. Though if it's the way that young Eddie Hearn says it is, well... What are you supposed to say? Eddie's blaming Joe. He's blaming Tesco Joe, smoking Joe Gallagher by name. And obviously, to touch on Natasha Jonas and Rhiannon Dixon, obviously not, uh, not here today, just sort of talk about that. Yeah, well, Natasha Jonas, you know, I saw Joe Gallagher's comments. You know, they've turned down six opponents. Um, various from uh, Victoria Bustos to Erika Farias to Vernon Kaiser, just standard fight. You know, Farias has lost four of her last six. You know, the others lost every round to Katie Taylor to um, Cecilia Brackhouse. Natasha Jonas agreed to rematch Katie Taylor for a lot of money. Or Why is Jonas asking for these two and ten opponents? I don't, that's, that's, it's not even Natasha Jonas, it's Joe Gallagher. And the answer is no. You know, you're on a lot of money to fight on Saturday. People want to see at least something decent we put forward six opponents that were all suitable in the end they came back with an opponent that was four and five or five and four we said not really but we'll accept it her management company dealt with it she pulled out of the fight then they came back with a girl that was two and ten no you had a stick you'd get but the answer's no but i'm gonna get stick anyway now she's not on the card ran and dixon was just unlucky and where Eddie Hearn is blaming Joe, blaming Joe outright, Tesco, Joe, Natasha Jonas says, Joe has been with Callum Johnson all week except Monday in Birmingham. Carlo was doing my corner. Blaming Joe is the go-to when things go wrong. Natasha added, me and MTK put a girl in front of him with a losing record. I'm not sure of her actual record off the top of my head, but this was literally with hours before the deadline. What he doesn't say is that I was taking nearly a 60% pay cut to take that fight because I just wanted to box. Take that fight with that girl that's got a losing record. If you look around at people's reactions to these comments from Eddie Hearn, what people are asking is, well, why is Natasha Jonas trying to box a girl with a losing record? I mean, why not a former champion in Victoria Bustos or Erica Farias, Verena Kaiser? This is what people are asking. Eddie Hearn says they offered up six fights, six names, six girls, and every single one of them was rejected. That needs to be addressed. And what about a Katie Taylor rematch? Because that's part of Eddie Hearn's version of the story. He's saying they offered Tasha big money to do a second fight with Katie. James Tweedle asked Natasha Jonas via social media thought you'd have been all over that Katie Taylor rematch Tosh to which Natasha replied I haven't hit away from the Katie rematch but like the Harper contract there was loads of other factors and parts that weren't good enough for me in the long run they thought the pull of a rematch was enough and it's not in the bigger scheme of things. Sounds like what it sounds like. And it sounds like Natasha Jonas rejected a second fight with Katie Taylor. Second fight that I think probably would have went down sometime before the end of this year, maybe in December. Natasha added, there was a lot of other factors very much like the Harper situation. I have to do what's right in the long run for me and my baby. And you know, I don't want to blame Natasha for this, I don't, but somebody on her side of things is mucking up the situation because it's becoming a pattern. And he doesn't blame Natasha, he says it's Joe. And Natasha will tell you, it's not Joe, Joe's not involved in those conversations, that's her management, the people over there at 
MTK, though. One way or another, regardless of who's doing it, it's the why that people are stuck on. Why would a Bustos fight? Or a Farias fight? Or a Verena Kaiser fight? Why would that be? Why would they reject those fights? You know, every single one of those fighters. And I gotta tell you, I'd give Natasha Jonas very good odds to beat all of them. Every single one of them. Hell, she might knock one or two of them out. And what the hell happened? Natasha says she's gotta do what's right for her and her baby in the long run. And with those things in mind, listen, I think Natasha Jonas is excellent. I fucking love her. She's fit, she's gorgeous, and she can fight. But the reality of it is, she's 36 years old and she's not getting any younger. This was supposed to be a relatively simple situation, a rebound fight. No more, no less. And any one of those opponents, Victoria Bustos, Verena Kaiser, Erika Farias, who's coming right off a loss to Michaela Mayer. Two back-to-back -back losses to Jessica McCaskill before that. What was wrong with those opponent choices? And who were the other three? The other three girls, because Eddie Hearn says he offered you six girls, six fights. Seems like Team Jonas and Match remain a good fit. It's what it seems like because this is becoming a pattern. The rematch with Terry, that fizzled out. Rematch with Katie Taylor, that fizzled out as well. They try to get you a rebound fight, can't get it over the line, guys can't agree on the opponent choices, and Tasha's not getting any younger, she's 36 years old, her team, they need to think long and hard about what they want to do, because 130, 135, 140, Matchroom's got the run of all those weights, more or less, they've got Terry Harper, the WBC champion, and they're still having dialogues with Choi, upstairs at 135, they've got Katie Taylor, who holds all the belts, at 135. At 140 pounds this fall, they've got a tournament. And that four-woman tournament involves all the belts at 140. So that at the end of it, early next year, they can crown an undisputed champion. So from 130 to 135 and 140, Matchroom more or less has the run of the place. And you don't want to go burning bridges with them because these are the weights. These are the divisions where Natasha can campaign. Some people are saying they think she's going to go to Sky. I don't know if there's any truth to that, though. If there is, and she were to go to Sky Sports and box under the boxer banner, who's she going to fight? Boxer ain't got no champions over there for her. There's a lot that we don't know here and now, so I'll say this much. Might seem like Team Jonas and Matchroom, they're really not a good fit. Things aren't working out. There always seems to be a problem. But for Natasha Jonas's best interests, they need to keep that relationship with Matchroom active, open, and functional. Because Matchroom can give her better opportunities than Sky Sports can. She boxes on Sky. Who's she going to fight? For what title? I don't know if that's what Team Jonas is thinking, but it needs to be said. Sky can't do for them what Matchroom can. Not at those weights. In middleweight news, per tweet from Michael Benson, it has been announced that Chris Eubank Jr. will now fight on October 16th this month in Newcastle against Vanik Aldejou. After his bout last weekend was called off on fight day, Boxer Sky Card also features Huey Fury, Louis Ritson, and is headlined by Savania Marshall. You know, initially I thought that Huey Fury's fight with Christian Hamill was the main event. I thought Huey Fury was headlining that card. It's only right that Savannah Marshall be the headliner because she's the only world champion on the entire card. She's taking on unbeaten Lolita Musea. On that card, you're going to see Huey Fury, who I just mentioned, Chris Eubank Jr., who I just mentioned, Steven Robinson, USSR, who bears a striking resemblance to Dolph Lundgren in Rocky IV. You're going to see Georgia O'Connor make her professional debut, and you're going to see former Matchroom alum April Hunter attempt to advance to a professional record of 5-0. and oh. I mean, as a card, as a package, I actually like it because I'm tracking the progress of several of these fighters. So Chris Eubank Jr. versus Vanik Aldejan as a fight, as an individual middleweight contest, I have to say... Chris Eubank Jr. should be fighting a better guy than this. I think this guy's ranked somewhere 97. Not dissimilar from the L. Beer guy he was gonna fight. When Chris Eubank Jr. jumped into bed with Wasserman, Wasserman slash Sarlin Promotions, you know, I figured that moving forward, what we're gonna see is Chris versus a lot of German guys, a lot of German talent, though not necessarily world-level guys, world-level talent. And Chris, at minimum, he was a world title challenger. He has fought at that level, he did against George Groves. And the feeling is, because Chris has already had his tune-up fight this year, which was needed, by the way, against Morrison, you know, because before that, Chris hadn't fought in a while. The last time he was in action 
before that Morrison fight was in December of 2019, just before the pandemic hit. The pandemic hit, and Chris sat out all of 2020. Thus, he needed a tune-up fight when this year rolled around, and I understood. He had just paired up with Roy Jones Jr. That was his first fight with Roy in his corner. I understood that a lighter touch was in order, and they've gotten that lighter touch out of the way. I mean, the feeling is, you want to see more serious matchmaking for Chris Eubank Jr., because right now, it just seems like he's floating around, just floating around, no real aim. It doesn't look like Chris is after a solo fight or an Andre fight. He's been talking a lot about Triple G, but Triple G's booked, at least for the time being. He's supposed to fight Ryota Murata before this year is out. Perhaps that's a fight they can visit, rather revisit, since they were supposed to fight sometime ago. We all know what happened. Uh, Chris Eubank Jr.'s side of things fucked that up. He shattered. Better still, it's a fight that can be revisited sometime next year, provided that Triple G makes it past Ryota Murata and unifies those two world titles. For the time being, he's fighting this Vonick Adejan guy, and look, I don't want to be a complainer. I don't want to be a wet blanket. The last time I saw Chris, he didn't look nothing spectacular. So this being his second fight under Roy Jones Jr.'s tutelage, I want to see a more put-together fighter. I want to see a more put-together Chris Eubank Jr. that actually has some kind of fucking wow factor because... This ain't a world-level guy he's fighting. He fought that Morrison guy to a decision, and that's fine by me. That's permissible because he needed those rounds. He hadn't fought in a while. A lot of ring rust to shake off. This time, I want to see a more put-together fighter. I want to see a knockout, if I'm being honest. This guy's been stopped before. Vonick's lone defeat came at the hands of Kevin Koji and Bud seven years ago, 2014. Fifth round TKO stoppage, and he hasn't lost a fight since, I get that, but... Chris Eubank Jr., comparatively, he has fought at a much higher level than Vonick has, so... There is a bar of standard. There are certain expectations. And for fighting these kinds of guys, the least you can do is rack up a highlight reel knockout. Because you're not exactly taking the middleweight division by storm fighting these kinds of guys. Look for this on the 16th. Finally, ahead of this weekend's big heavyweight title fight, per a tweet from Michael Benson, Tyson Fury said, You've seen Anthony Joshua lose all his belts to Oleksandr Yusik. He didn't make excuses. He didn't cry about it. Same with the Andy Ruiz Jr. knockout. Never made excuses. That, in my opinion, is a different man than what I'm facing. You heard that right, where Tyson Fury normally tries to slight Anthony Joshua by lording his win over Deontay Wilder around. Now he's using Anthony Joshua to slight Deontay Wilder. The guy's full of surprises. Full of shit sometimes, too. Tyson Fury reacted to the news that he may have to face Dillian Veidt after the Deontay Wilder fight, provided he makes it through it as his mandatory challenger. And he said, that's something I've not been told or am even interested in right now. I've got Deontay Wilder to deal with first, and then we'll sit down and make a decision on what's next. No guarantees. There never are any in life, and even less in boxing. Boxing, least of all. Who knows if Tyson Fury's gonna make good on his word to face Dillian Veidt afterwards, because he said that he would, provided he beats Wilder. WBC's not giving him much of a choice, though he can always choose to vacate, if you know what I mean. So let's get down to brass tacks. What do I think is gonna happen tomorrow night? Well, I don't have a horse in the race. I don't actually care which one of these two guys win because I'm sick of the both of them. The both of them, pain in the ass. They are. They're both full of shit in their own way, but we're not here to assess which one of these two guys is full of more shit than the other. Conventional wisdom dictates that the technician in a rematch, or in this case, a three-peat, usually performs better. Technician's got a deeper toolbox. And we know that in this fight, it's Tyson Fury who's the technician, and it's Deontay Valder who's the puncher. Earlier this week, we talked about how Valder, you know, he's not that big on skill because he has power. And those are his own words. Not mine. That has been Deontay Valder's approach to heavyweight boxing for as long as I can remember. And I don't think in one camp with Malik Scotch and Don House, that's going to change. I just don't. He's got to punch his chance. That's what he's got. In the heavyweight division, that's what every guy's got. Heavyweight division, every single one of these guys is one clean punch away from being knocked the fuck out. And who knows, maybe Wilder can make that happen? But I'm not betting on it. Most people aren't betting on it. Most people feel that Tyson Fury has effectively cracked the code to beating Deontay Wilder, and he's about to receive an even worse beating in this fight 
than he received February of last year. I didn't want to waste too much time on either of these guys because I ain't got a horse in the race. I ain't Team Fury and I ain't Team Wilder. I'm not a mascot for either one of these two guys, though I will say that Tyson Fury's line of questioning, at least from where I was sitting, seemed to have been making Deontay Wilder rather uncomfortable. The otherwise very outspoken Deontay Wilder. Who decided to plead the fifth in the kickoff press conference for this trilogy. He's been a little bit more vocal as of late. So he doesn't really seem like the same guy he used to be. Seems to me like a guy who's been in a cocoon, a nurturing environment where his peers, his friends are attempting to rebuild his confidence, build him back up so he can get that WBC title back. Posting montage videos. Training footage, mitt work, new things and new areas they're attempting to work on or revisit or whatever the hell it is they're doing. I mean, I don't know anybody that releases that much footage of what they're working on ahead of a fight because ideally you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't. You'd work on those things in secret so you have an element of surprise. None of that matters now. Press conferences, glove gate, the fact Wilder's still wearing a costume. Still dressed up like Lord Sauron. From Lord of the Rings, conventional wisdom dictates that the technician often does better the second and even the third time out because he's got more to draw from, more ways to win a fight. Deontay's been out too long for me. You're probably thinking to yourself, Tyson Fury's been out just as long as Wilder, so what do you mean? Well, Deontay Wilder's not a prolific puncher. He's never been a volume guy. He doesn't go out there and systematically beat guys. You know, he's not that kind of fighter. He relies on his reflexes to get off that big right hand. Reflexes and timing. And about 19 months out from his last fight, the fight where he got that shellacking. His reflexes might be dull. A sharper, more active Deontay Deontay Wilder fought Tyson Fury the first two times and the right hand wasn't enough to seal the deal. 19 months of inactivity. 19 months out. 19 months later from the second fight. What are his reflexes like now? Fury's been inactive too. But Fury's not the one relying on a single punch delivered by way of his timing, his speed, and his reflexes to get the job done. Fury's not the one hitter-quitter guy relying on a single shot to get the job done. Wilder is. If I had to guess, I think the third fight's gonna go the same way the second one did. Or worse. Tyson Fury's saying he's gonna make Wilder quit. He's gonna make him submit the way those MMA guys submit. You know, when they tap out. All of that stuff. He's saying he's gonna make the guy quit in his corner. He made good on his word last time that he was gonna stop Deontay Wilder. And he did. So maybe he makes good on his word this time, too. I've no stock in a single training camp with Malik Scotch, his buddy, turning Deontay Wilder into a completely different fighter. That just doesn't happen. Usually it doesn't. Deontay Wilder's best bet at winning this fight is a cold knockout. And that didn't work the first two times, so I'm not that confident in the third. I'm picking Fury. All the barbs have been traded. The pleasantries have been exchanged. The boys are all weighed in, and there's nothing left to do but... Knuckle up.